Today's webinar is titled, An Introduction to SuperLearner. Let me introduce our speaker, Dr. Eric Polly. Dr. Polly is an assistant professor of biostatistics in the Division of Biomedical Statistics and Informatics at Mayo Clinic. He received his PhD in biostatistics from the University of California at Berkeley in 2010. Together with Mark Vangelon, they developed the SuperLearner Ensemble Prediction Methodology and the associated prediction software. Prior to joining Mayo, Dr. Pauly was a mathematical statistician in the biometric research branch at the U.S. National Cancer Institute. At the Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis, his primary focus was on the design and analysis of preclinical and early phase oncology drug development projects. His research area involves the development and evaluation of prediction methods, statistical methods for validation of diagnostic assays, and precision medicine clinical trial design. So we're very fortunate to have Dr. Polly with us today to provide an introduction to the super learner. Great, thank you very much, Susan. Um, happy to be here to give an introduction to the super learner. Um, so, as Susan mentioned, the super learner methodology is an example of ensemble learning where we take individual based learners, um, typically a diverse set of algorithms, and then built upon the framework of uh, the fundamental mathematical framework of cross validation, we try to come up with an optimal ensemble of the predictors. And so, my goal today is I'm going to sort of walk through what that sentence means and go through the details of what cross-validation is, and how to come up with these ensembles, and what do we mean by that optimal uh, combination at the end, and why this is a preferred framework. And so I will start off with a little bit of history um, before we jump into the, the theory behind this, that this isn't necessarily a new idea. This idea of using cross-validation to both try to evaluate and come up with an optimal model has been around for quite a while. Uh, the earliest we found um, through the literature review was uh, back in 1974, which really laid out a lot of the fundamentals uh, for cross-validation. And in that paper, this methodology was referred to as model mix, this idea of combining different uh, individual models together. From there, um, probably the more commonly referred to um, methodology of this framework is often referred to as stacking or stacked generalization and stacked regression. And those didn't come around until 1994, where Wolpert uh, was working on ways of combining neural networks together uh, using uh, cross-validation to determine the weights uh, for individual neural networks to come up with a final model. And then after uh, Wolpert's paper on stacked generalization for neural networks, uh, Bryman and his regression setting and proposed the idea of stacked regression. Um, instead of the basis function being neural networks, in that setting, the, in Bryman's paper, the, the individual algorithms were linear regression with different subsets of the variables combined together or stacked together. Um, and then in uh, 2007, um, uh, with uh, Mark Vanderlan and uh, Alan Hubbard, we sort of extended this and really tried to come up with the theoretical foundations and the, op and the oracle properties of why this sort of ensembling is an optimal procedure for coming up with prediction models. And in that paper and subsequently, we've referred to this as super learner. So to dive into this, we really have to sort of start at the foundation of cross-validation. So the next few slides, I'm gonna walk through sort of what the sort of the data we're expecting and how do we go about thinking of what cross-validation is actually doing. And so if we start off, with our usual setting where I have some observed data, I have uh, n observations, where I have a set of covariates x, um, which could be p-dimensional, and I have some outcome of interest y that I've observed on everyone within my data set, and this data follows some uh, like often unknown data generating distribution that I'm just going to refer to as PO. Within that uh, setting, I then you typically have a parameter that I'm interested in, um, if we're in, say, the regression setting, it might be the expectation of y given the observed covariance x could be the parameter that I'm interested in for this prediction setting. And then with that uh, parameter of interest, psi of x, we also need to define a loss function, where a loss function is going to tell me some difference between my observed value of y and that prediction value coming out of the, the algorithm that we've estimated from the data. 
And when I'm specifying that parameter image, I also have to define a parameter space that I'm going to search over uh, to try to estimate what a good value of psi of x is going to be that will minimize that loss function. And so when I've defined those individual components, I can also define what the optimal value is. And I, we're going to refer to that as psi 0. And psi 0 is defined as the value within this parameter space of psi that minimizes the expected loss or the risk over my full data generating distribution. And so psi 0 is the optimal. And we're going to try to estimate that with the various approaches. And so that was a little bit abstract. We can think about this in the usual, uh, with an example from the regression setting, where what I might be interested in is the expected value of y given x that I might specify with like a regression model, where I have beta 1 at times x1 and beta 2 times x2 and so on. And usually in that set in setting, the loss function we often think about is the squared error loss. And so that would just be my observed outcome y minus my predicted value given the uh, values of x, that squared. And then I could then average this over all my observations to get the ex an estimate of the expected loss being the mean squared error. And so this is our general setup that we're working in. And now we sort of have to think about what do we mean by cross-validation? And I'm going to introduce some uh, terminology here um, to sort of help us walk through and define what we mean by cross-validation. And so the first part is this idea that that full um, entire uh, observation set that we had with my n observations, I'm going to label this my learning data set. This is everything that I have available to me to be able to estimate that prediction model. That's my learning data set. And what we typically do is we split that learning data set into uh, what I'm labeling here as a training and validation set. And so the examples that I'm going to go through today in the context of SuperLearner, everything is using default cross-validation. I will just have a note that other forms of cross-validation can still apply within the SuperLearner framework, but the most commonly used is this idea of default cross-validation as sort of an optimal or um, efficient use of the data that we have available to us. And so um, I've sort of mathematically labeled out what I mean by default cross-validation below. And so I could think of capital V maybe being 10. I'm going to partition my data into 10 training and validation splits. And the component, the sort of the rules um, for uh, default cross-validation are such that the combination, I'm going to use T for my training and V for my validation uh, splits, is that the combination of my training and validation, when I mix them together, should be my entire data set. There should be no overlap of observations between my training and validation. They should be mutually exclusive. Um, and then each observation with my data set, each observation in my learning data set should only appear in a single validation set. And that's what we're referred to here. Everyone in my data set shows up in one and exactly one validation data set. And so these are these mutually exclusive splits of my data, and it's going to be exhaustive over all the, the learning data set that we have. And so this is some mathematical notation of that. I, I often find it easier to sort of visualize that. And so here's an example here, where if we think about um, a typical data table, where I have the uh, rows within this data table are my individual observations. And so it might go from 1 to n along the rows within my data set. And I have my covariates across the column. And what I can think about, and this is an, a visualization of five-fold cross-validation, is I would split my observations into five buckets. And so I have one, two, three, four, and five um, groups of my observations within my data set. And the first fold, let's say the first four-fifths of my data set, I'm going to specify as a training for the first fold. And the last one-fifth of my data set is going to be the validation split for my first fold. And then what I can do with this is I can then walk through my data through the five folds and sort of sequentially go. So now this would be my second fold, where this block, second block down here is now my validation. And what was previously my validation from the first fold is now going to be rolled back into the training data set. And we can see how if I sort of walk through my data in this fashion, 
every observation is always going to be in at least one uh, validation data split. And the observations um, between the training and the validation are always going to be mutually exclusive. Um, I never have the observations that's in both a training and a validation setting. So that's my sort of visualization of mechanically what we're doing when we talk about v-fold cross-validation. I was walking through the data like that. So now with that idea of the data splitting in mind, we then move to the step of, okay, I have the parameter interest. Um, we'll, we'll stick with the regression setting that I want to estimate the expected value of y given a set of major covariates. We then have to think about, well, what algorithms do I want to apply to this observed data set to try to estimate my parameter of interest, the psi? And so what we think about is we could define a library of algorithms that we think will work well on our given um, application that we're working on. And I'm going to use a subscript K to index those individual algorithms uh, within my data set. And so I may have up to capital K different algorithms that I'm going to apply on my given data set. And I've used a notation here that the maximal number of algorithms is a function of my sample size. So if I have a larger sample size, I can try more algorithms on my data set that I have available. But if I have a limited sample size, I probably don't want to use too many. We'll go into a little bit of detail about that. Um, but this idea that I can try different algorithms and I'm going to index their estimates with a subscript K. And we can sort of think about, you know, what do I mean by different algorithms on a given data set? Um, and there's lots of different ways to conceptualize that on a given data application. Um, there may be different subsets of the measured covariates. I may have, you know, some variables coming from clinical, some coming from a diagnostic assay, and maybe I want to build an algorithm just on clinical, or maybe just on molecular data, or maybe I want to combine them together, and those might represent different algorithms. I could also think about having different basis functions. Um, I could have different estimation procedures, could be something like a random forest and a gradient boosting. I can have all sorts of different sort of conceptualizations of algorithms um, that are all trying to estimate that same thing, the expectation of y given x, but they're doing it in slightly different ways. Um, and this gives that framework of that library of algorithms to allow us to go and evaluate. And so when I talk about library, this is um, the notation we're going to use. So then, now that I have that idea of a library of algorithms, we have to think about, well, what are we going to do with them? And typically, we're in the scenario where I want to figure out, of all those algorithms that I've tried on my data set, which one works best? And we can mathematically define that using this uh, notation here as a risk difference. I can think about the loss from my uh, case algorithm that I've specified minus the optimal that I defined earlier as the best possible algorithm. And this risk difference is um, over the distribution of the data generating is something that we'd be interested in. If I knew what this was, then the optimal algorithm within my library is the, the one that minimizes this expected loss, expected risk difference uh, over the, the data generating distribution. And so if I knew everything, this is what I would use to select what algorithm actually worked best um, for the different for the application that I'm interested in. But there's a few problems with this. One, we don't know the full data generating distribution and we don't know what is actually best. And so we have to come up with a mechanism to try to approximate this uh, for making that decision about what algorithm seems to be working best in terms of minimizing this risk difference between my individual algorithm and the optimal algorithm. And so if this becomes as small as possible, then I'm doing as I'm selecting the algorithms that work best uh, given the application that I'm working on. And so uh, one thing is I can't just do um, directly estimating the risk. Uh, what's usually referred to as the resubstitution estimate where I take the full data set that I have observed, I estimate my case model, and then I can go and estimate the empirical risk or the empirical loss uh, on that same data set. It's something we can do, but this has been shown to often to be optimistic, where this gives me a biased estimate of what the true risk is going to be in the general population. And so this is usually not a good 
estimate to be to use to try to select what algorithm seems to work well. Um, because of that problem where I'm using the same data to both estimate my model and then go in and evaluate the model um, within that given data set. And so this is not what we want to do. And so this is where the idea of the data splitting comes in. And so if I move, go back to the idea of the cross-validation of splits, what I can do now is I can go and I can train a model on just the observations within the uh, training set uh, for the Vs fold, and then evaluate the loss on the, the, the corresponding validation set um, from that data. So now I've created, I've split my data such that I have a data set that I can train that's independent of what I'm evaluating on. And then I loop over my V folds to get a more stable estimate or efficient use of all the data that I have available. And this gives me what's referred to as the cross-validation selector. And so I want to find the algorithm or the, the case uh, algorithm within my library that minimizes the average cross-validated loss function. And so this is a pretty standard operator that we can go and do. And this we've shown works well in that I have independence of the data used to train the algorithm from the data that's used to evaluate the algorithm. And it's efficient because it's using all the data within my data set. And so this is a reasonable approach to go and try to select uh, what algorithm is working well for my given problem. So with that in mind, um, I, you know, coming back to visualizations, I like to think about these geometrically. I could think about if I had six different algorithms that I was trying on a given data set, I could think about the, that cross-validation selector is just going to be selecting one of the vertices of this simplex as what algorithm seems to be working well, and that's the algorithm I'm gonna go forward with. But if we think back to my first slide where I described the optimal not necessarily being an individual algorithm, but a convex combination of the algorithms within my library that is gonna perform optimally, maybe closest to the best possible uh, algorithm, and this is where that concept of the super learner comes in. It expands the idea of cross-validation, where cross-validation would only look at these um, vertices or the nodes within the simplex, whereas the super learner says, well, what about all this red space in the middle being a convex combination of the individual algorithms may perform better than just selecting one of the individual algorithms and I can use that idea of cross-validation to try to say, am I doing better by combining or doing a convex combination of individual algorithms instead of just trying to select one of the algorithms? Now, one of the nice things from this visualization is it still includes the possibility that one algorithm all by itself performs best. And within that super learner, it is possible that I might just select one algorithm give, given weight one and everyone else given weight zero, but it also allows for that flexibility that maybe the best algorithm is going to be a weighted combination of the different uh, algorithms within my library. And so this is a visualization of that. So with that said, um, I sort of walked through this idea of cross-validation and started to introduce the components of uh, the super learner. Now we're sort of gonna lay it all out. This is um, a visualization of, or a, a diagram of what the super learner framework or what the super learner algorithm is actually doing on a given data set when we're trying to uh, estimate that regression problem. And so what this is, I can imagine I'm starting over here at the data block. This is that observed data, the learning data, all of my observations are there. The first step that I can do is sort of come down here to the bottom. I take all the data that I have available and I train each of the prediction algorithms that I had specified within my library. So I might try uh, GLM, I might, there's another algorithm called DSA, I could try random forest, I could try gradient boosting. I throw all of the algorithms that I had specified in my library um, at the full data set, get their predicted values, get their estimates, and then sort of set them aside. I've done that now with the full data. And then I go back to my data and I do that uh, V-fold cross-validation where I'm splitting my data set into the V mutually exclusive blocks. And then I'll start here at the top, that first fold. 
And so I imagine I take out the first block of my data, and then on the remaining um, sets of data, excluding that first block, I train each of those individual prediction algorithms, um, just like what I had done on the full data, but now on that um, training data set from the cross-validation. And then for each of those algorithms, I then get the predicted values of Y back on this um, first block that I had split out, for all the individuals within that data set, and then I sort of start creating what we refer to in the, the superlinear paper as the Z matrix, where now the columns in this matrix are the different algorithms within, um, uh, within my library, and the rows are going to be the, uh, match up with the observations from my full data set, but instead of being the observed outcome Y, it's going to be the predicted value from that algorithm, uh, given the, the covariance X uh, for that observation, uh, when that observation is part of the validation split. And so I am sort of can loop through my V-fold, and it, uh, I end up piecing together this Z matrix, where my, the dimensionality of the Z matrix is going to be equal to my sample size for the number of rows, and the columns uh, within that uh, matrix are going to be the number of algorithms uh, within my uh, library that I've specified. But that everything now is predicted values from when that observation is included in a validation split. And then what I can do um, is I can then take, sort of merge in the observed outcome Y for that observation. And so just pulling that back in there. And then I can do a regression of the observed outcome on these cross-validated predicted values um, where I then can put the constraints that we talked about earlier on the coefficients, being that I want them to be non-negative and sum up to one. And what that regression is then doing is solving that convex combination, minimizing the cross-validated uh, risk, cross-validated loss estimate. And so it's sort of a little trick to be able to go in there and do that. I could mathematically also go through and do the usual cross-validation. But this sort of saves that step in there where I can estimate individual coefficients for each of the algorithms within my library um, minim that the overall uh, is minimizing cross-validated uh, loss function within that set. And so from this process over here, I don't save any of the individual cross-validated model fits, but what I get is the weight for each of the algorithms. And so I might give weight of 0.2 to GLM, and then 0.8 to random forest, that's what I would be saving out of this process here. And those are the optimal super learner ensemble weights for my given data application. And then I'll combine those with the algorithms that were trained on the full data set, and that's my final super learner. It's the weights from doing the cross-validation combined with the, the best possible algorithm I can get from by using the full data set. I combine those two pieces together, and that's what the super learner is. So that's sort of the whole algorithm, sort of in one slide, walking through the various steps that we go through within the application. Uh, so with that, sort of talk a little bit about why we would want to do that. And so if we go back to the original paper from 2007, what we did was we provided oracle results demonstrating the optimality of the super learner. And by optimality, what we mean is that as we increase the sample size, we're going to be getting, we're going to be selecting our final super learner is going to be as close as possible in terms of that risk difference that we mentioned earlier to uh, the optimal model. And so we're converging to that as the sample size increase. And so it's telling us that we're doing a good job of figuring out not just what algorithm works well, but what, con what combination or ensemble of the individual algorithms is going to be closest to the true uh, best possible model within my parameter space. Um, there are some assumptions that go along with that. We do require to have a bounded loss function. That's because I have to do an expectation over the data generating distribution. If it was unbounded, then the expectation would go to infinity. Um, so that's an easy thing to control in there. We just have to be careful with the loss functions we're specifying and how we're doing the numerical optimization. And then the other sort of surprising result was that the cardinality or the number of algorithms within my library 
can actually grow as a polynomial with n. And so we were thinking we, you know, we'd have to really constrain the number of algorithms that we'd apply on a real data set to control that overfitting. But polynomial in n is actually pretty generous. So we can actually throw quite a few different algorithms into the library and still sort of control um, overfitting within this, as long as we're staying within this framework. And so that's a sort of important result about how many algorithms can I really try within this framework of doing that ensemble and make sure that I'm not going to be overfitting uh, within the final prediction model. Where by overfitting, what I mean is that the, the estimate of the expected loss is very different from the true expected loss is how I'm sort of conceptualizing overfitting. And we don't want to be doing that. We want the expected loss, our estimate of the expected loss to be close to what the true expected loss is if I knew what the full data generating distribution is. And that's sort of a good property that says I am selecting something that is close to that optimal. And so with that, sort of thinking back to what is the super learner, and if I were to go and implement this in practice, what do I need to think about? And so I've sort of laid it out here as sort of the menu of if I'm gonna go do this myself, what do I need um, to do? The, probably the most important part is that first one, is what are the algorithms to put into my li into the library? And you know, especially given the previous results, that you can actually throw quite a few algorithms relative to your sample size into the library. What we really recommend is to really be creative. Think about all sorts of different possibilities of things that might potentially work well for the different applications you're working in. And some of these are just going to be modifications of tuning parameters within the algorithms. But also think about things like different subsets of the variables or, you know, I, I'm often working in very high dimensional space where there's different ways where we could subset what variables I want to include in my prediction algorithm. And each of those different subsets could be conceptualized as different algorithms within the library. Or I may think about, um, you know, an algorithm that has uh, some tuning parameters in that. And instead of trying to select uh, the tuning parameters nested within that uh, algorithm, I could just sort of pre-specify those and different tuning parameter values within the same algorithm can just be different algorithms within the library and let the ensembling figure that, figure out what seems to work well and not try to worry about doing nested selection of tuning parameters within that process. And so the important thing is to really be creative and think about uh, what could potentially work and let's throw that into the library. Uh, the next component in there is the loss function. Uh, this tends to be very application specific about what an appropriate loss function would be given the problem that you're working on. Um, and so I, I don't really have general suggestions about that, but there are, you know, sort of standard things we can think about being like log likelihood or squared error or um, similar loss functions, but it may just sort of depend on the problem that you're working on. Um, and sort of really thinking about what are we trying to minimize with the um, uh, application that we're working on. And then finally, the third component for the super learner is how do I combine the individual algorithms into a final ensemble? And this is the one, I, 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 the one that we use most often is this combination, convex combination that I mentioned at the beginning. We found that to be very robust and stable and it has some nice properties that it keeps the scaling that the, if the, each of the individual algorithms are on the, the units of the outcome, and by doing a convex combination, I'm keeping the scale. Um, the, the theoretical results don't require it to be a convex combination. There's some other um, approaches out there that just do like a non-negative weights. Um, you could do like a lasso. You could do a more complex uh, function combining the individual algorithms into that ensemble. They still fit within this framework, um, but in applications, we tend to strict stick with that convex combination because we've shown it tends to be robust and perform well. But that is a, that is a possibility and something you could think about uh, for your individual application. And just to sort of talk a little bit, I sort of walk through the examples of what the super learner actually is. Uh, one of the things we have done is gone through and do some extensive evaluation of does it really perform you know, optimally, like what we said in the theoretical results, on real data sets. And so this figure here was an example. I'm going to spend a few minutes sort of walking through this. What we did is we collected a whole bunch of different real data sets that were all sort of trying to estimate a regression, getting the expectation of y given x. And on all of these different data sets, 
we tried all the different algorithms you see listed here in the X. Um, so a wide variety of different algorithms plus super learner and what's referred to as the discrete super learner is that cross validation selector. Each dot within this um, figure here represents a different data set that we went and evaluated. And the scaling here on the X is the relative mean squared error where everyone was rel um, relative to the mean squared error that we got from using uh, a generalized linear model, uh, a regression outcome. So we scaled everything to the GLM because across the different data sets, they all had different scales. So we, we made everything relative to the uh, uh, linear model, the, the GLM model. And so what you can see from this result is that in some data sets, you know, there are algorithms, something like a uh, BART, which is like a, a Bayesian um, random forest, may perform really well, but on some data sets, it didn't perform well. And on a given data set, we don't really know that. We don't know if we're going to be doing good or not if I had just used BART. Um, or, you know, things down here like random forest, again, some data sets it performed really well, some data sets it performed very poorly. And so if I were to just use a single algorithm across a wide variety of different data sets, sometimes I'll do well, sometimes I might not do well. But the sort of the nice feature here is that, that the super learner and this framework of using cross validation does a really good job in even on these uh, real data sets with um, smaller sample size of being adaptive and trying to upweight algorithms that are performing well in terms of the cross validated loss and downweighting algorithms that aren't performing well. And so across all the different data sets, we really are showing that we're doing a really good job. We may not always be the best algorithm. It's possible um, that one individual algorithm might outperform the super learner for that given data set. But as I go across multiple data sets or sort of over my career, it's going to be, perform well and be a data adaptive, but also robust, not overfitting not performing worse than just doing a GLM model. And so this is really sort of an empirical evaluation of the, the theoretical results that we showed earlier on the optimality of doing this sort of cross elevated based ensemble modeling and the flexibility that we gain from being able to do that. And so to sort of sum up that framework here a bit, um, or, or just to sort of highlight some of the components here, for any given data application, we don't know what algorithms are going to work well. Um, sometimes what we'll see out there in uh, the real world is people will take a data set, they'll try an algorithm, they'll see if it works well. Um, if it doesn't work well, they'll make some modeling decisions. And there, there's this iterative process going on where you're um, intuit, you're, you're, the analyst is sort of learning from the data, but then that leads to this problem of overfitting. If I'm iteratively trying something, see if it works. If it doesn't work, I'm going to try something else. And going through that process until I get something that looks like it's working well, that sort of modeling framework tends to lead to overfitting. And even if I do go through that whole process and at that very end, my final algorithm that I selected, I do a cross validation on my given data set, those cross validation results are no longer valid because it's not including all the different steps that you use to get to that algorithm. And so just saying we did cross validation, you really have to have cross validation of the whole process going on. And that's where this iterative approach doesn't work or it can break down within real settings. But if we go to the super learner framework where everything is nested within, um, within the, the algorithm, within the framework of doing the cross validation, I can pre-specify a very large and diverse set of algorithms a priori lock that down so it, I'm not using what seems to work well on my given data set to motivate what algorithms to try on that given data set. If I a priori specify it and lock it down, then I'm within this framework where I can still have a very flexible approach to trying to solve my regression setting, but also have that built-in control of not overfitting. And this is where I think the super learner framework can really excel in that it has that flexibility but also has that control to avoid uh, overfitting or overly optimistic estimates of the prediction. And so that's where I think this framework can really excel in some of these settings. Um, and so, as I mentioned, the super learner provides a flexible but robust procedure for estimation of ensemble prediction models. 
um, really, you know, in your own applications, really try to think of a large possible library. Don't worry about putting too many things in that aren't going to work. The framework's pretty good at downloading or throwing things out that aren't going to be helpful, but it's better to throw it, typically better to throw in more, uh, unless you have a very limited number of observations you're trying to train on. Um, I, you know, I had mentioned some simple regressions, but this can easily be extended to large number of variables, and it can still work within those settings. And often this actually gives you a lot of flexibility too, because you can think about different ways of screening or doing dimension reduction, just become different algorithms within that framework. Um, but the whole uh, work on doing the uh, loss functions and the cross validation still applies. So this actually works really well in uh, large dimensional data sets uh, as well as smaller dimensional data sets. And as Susan mentioned last month, that the SuperLearner fits really well within the targeted learning framework. It doesn't need to be in there. It can just, you know, if we're interested just in prediction, it's a great framework for that. But when we move into this targeted learning framework, it's actually really ideal for that because it gives me the advantage of having very flexible models for both the propensity score and the Q model uh, as that Susan mentioned last month, but also you know, having that targeted step from the targeted learning approach to really focus in on that parameter of interest might be that average treatment effect. And so even though I'd done a very data adaptive, flexible modeling strategy, that targeting step still sort of keeps things under control. Um, and so they really work very well together, uh, the super learner combined with the, the targeted learning framework. So independent, individually they work well, but they really sort of, they, they're very symbiotic in how they work together. Um, and, and so with that, I thought I would sort of uh, just have a few slides talking about um, some of the software that we've developed to implement this, because I know that algorithm can be a little bit hard to think about, well, how am I going to sit down and code? You know, all the cross validation steps can be a little bit tricky to do all the tracking, but one of the nice things is we provided software that automates all of the sample splitting and conceptualizing how do I be most efficient in bringing in algorithms and having that very diverse set of algorithms within my library. And so the one I'm going to talk about today um, is an R package called the Super Learner. Uh, this was first publicly released um, about 10 years ago. Um, we had it internally at Berkeley for a year, years and then released it over onto CRAN in 2010. Um, we still are keeping that up to date and trying to keep it uh, running and adding new features to it all the time. Um, and there's both both available on CRAN and then there's the development version over on GitHub um, if you're looking to sort of really dive into the code and sort of what's coming next. Uh, within the SuperLearn, it includes built into it over 30 different prediction algorithms that have been sort of pre-built in there. But the sort of the really nice thing about the, the package is that it also provides a framework that if you want to bring in your own algorithm, there's a way to do that. And what I like about this is that you're not just limited to what we can think of as algorithms for your problem. There's a way that you can build your own algorithms and then feed it into the super learner. And so you don't have to go through and do all the cross validation, and all the different components, but it has that flexibility of not just being limited to what we can provide. Um, and I'll just sort of highlight, um, I do have maintain another GitHub page called Super Learner Extra. Um, and so these are some of the additional add-ons or some functions that people might find helpful, but don't necessarily sort of make it into the primary Super Learner package. Um, so it's a good place if you want to go share, um, you know, if you've written some of your own algorithms that you want to share with other people, the, the GitHub page for Super Learner Extra is, is a great place to do that. And so it doesn't necessarily lock you into being part of the full CRAN uh, package, but it's a way for people to share um, examples of what they've created and what they've put in place for the Super Learner. And I, I will highlight that the, this R package isn't the only um, option out there for uh, doing the Super Learner framework. There's some other really wonderful uh, packages out there. H2O has an auto ML uh, maintained or created and maintained by Aaron Liddell, which does a wonderful job and works really well on, uh, has really been optimized for large N data sets and is still in the back end doing that same uh, super learner ensembling is built into that. Uh, there's another R package out there called Machine Shop, which uh, again, it does a really good job of trying to bring together a whole bunch of different prediction algorithms and making it as easy as possible to do those stacking. Um, and so the, the barrier for going in and doing these uh, ensemble, these super ensembles is, is fairly low and makes it very easy to do. So that's another great package 
And there's another one, if you're familiar with the carrot framework uh, within R, there's a carrot ensemble that if you're sort of within the carrot environment and you want to create a super learner object out of that, there's a nice package out there called carrot ensemble. Um, so one of the things, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the super learner R package here. And so one of the things, the first thing when you go and you install it, uh, the first thing people are often asking is, well, what is available? What algorithms are built in it? And so there is an internal function called list wrappers where you can go and have it print out all the pre-specified algorithms that are already sort of programmed within the R package. And you can see the list out here. I, this is a little bit older version of it. Um, but there were sort of adding things over time. But you can see that there's quite a variety. We have things like generalized additive models. There's uh, random forest. There's recursive partitioning. There's gradient boosting. Uh, a very a good diversity of algorithms built in. But again, thinking back to the idea of building your own library, this should be that foundation that you then built on top of it. You know, get creative, modify some of these algorithms, sort of play around with these, or what else could you bring to your problem that would add to what's already included within the package. And the idea then is what you do to actually on your given data set is you then have to go and specify this library. And the way that this is done is you would, you would have uh, basically a character vector within R where you list out all the different algorithms you want to try within your data set. And then there is a function called super learner where you give your outcome value y, your x is going to be your data frame of your covariates, the entire, the full uh, learning data set. And then you specify the list of all the different algorithms within your library um, as a character vector. The method function, you can go and read up a little bit more about that um, in the help documentation, is sort of controlling what loss function you want to specify and what the ensemble method you're going to use. And so um, this default here being non-negative least squares does that uh, convex combination, and the loss function is the, the squared error loss function built into that. But there is a framework within the, the method arguments if you want to go bring in your own loss functions or your own methods uh, for doing the ensemble, the method argument is the way that you can control those individual components. And so if you're going in R and actually trying to estimate your own super learners, the function you're going to be using is called superlearner. That is the primary function for estimating that, where you feed in all your data, specify what your library is, and then using the method object um, to specify your loss function and your ensembling method um, is going to be your, the primary superlearner that we showed um, up above. And so I did just want to talk a little bit about um, sort of the structure, because I think, like I said, I think the important thing if you're going to go and implement it is actually being able to bring in your own algorithms. And so we have this idea of there's a function called write.sl.template where we've tried to make it as easy as possible to write your own super learner wrappers to be that will then feed into the super learner object. And I just kind of want to spend a few minutes walking through the different parts of what this template looks like. So when you come to your own applications, you know what you'll need to modify uh, if you want to bring in your own algorithm into um, a super learner ensemble. And so I'm highlighting the top here that the input arguments for a super learner wrapper always have to have this structure. Um, they have to have these names because it's feeding in with doing the cross validation in the back end. And so the arguments that you can give to a super learner wrapper the first argument is going to be called capital Y. That's going to be your outcome, um, typically a numeric vector um, from your data. X is going to be the training data. These are the covariates that will be feeding into your algorithm. Uh, typically, is going to be a data frame. There are options for it to be a matrix, but the, that's the, my observed data, X and Y. New X, what this would specify, and is not something um, you sort of need to have right away, but this is if I train a model on Y and X, what are the observations that I want to get predicted values of Y? And that's what the new X argument is going to be. It's going to be a data frame similar to X that represents the observations that I want to get a predicted value uh, within, uh, within this uh, wrapper function. And then when we have an option for family, um, and this is where you can specify whether you're doing a uh, linear regression or a binomial, 
um, or we do have a separate function that's now also available out uh, on GitHub for doing uh, Cox regression. So if you have a, a proportional hazard, a time to event um, is now implemented there as well. If you have observation weights, that's an argument here, um, and then ID. And so typically in most cases, the what you're gonna be working with is you'll have a Y, X, new X being the observation, the data values get predictions on, and you may or may not need the additional variables, but these are sort of the required to go in the, in those functions. And then looking through the body of that wrapper, there's different components. The first thing you would typically be doing is where I need to go and estimate my predictor. Um, and so that's where I'm using the values of Y and X to estimate what, you know, maybe the random forest or the um, gradient boosting algorithm. That would sort of go in the, the front here where I'm using the arguments Y and X to estimate that model. And I have the options here where it may be conditional on family. You may use a different method. You may or may not need that. And then the, after we've done that estimation, the required outputs from a superlinear wrapper are these next few lines here. And so the first one is referred to as pred, and these are the predicted values from the, new, from the observations in new X. So if I've estimated a model up here, I then have to have some output being a vector of predicted values from that algorithm built on the observations from the new X. And I have to call that uh, PRED. And that's that, uh, so the first required out, uh, output uh, from one of the superlinear wrappers. The next, um, and it could just be an empty vector, um, but the, the second object that needs to be returned uh, from a superlinear wrapper is what's called fit. And this is where you can save any of the information that you may want to refer to later. So it may just be your fitted object um, from running your regression. It may be additional tuning parameters. It may be some additional notes um, that you want saved out of the, some of the objects built in there. And so this is a flexible object um, called fit where you're saving uh, the information uh, that was used um, for that individual prediction algorithm. And then we were using, if you're familiar with our programming, you can put an S3 class on there um, just so it helps with some of the dispatch uh, later on, uh, but it's not necessarily required if you're building your own. And then I have to, these last two lines within the wrapper, you just want to leave untouched. And this is just saying that my output from these wrappers needs to be the predicted values and any of that additional fit information that I've saved. And so that's an overview of what these uh, wrappers look like. Um, and so you, it gives you a framework for coming in and building your own prediction algorithms. As long as it has the same inputs and then these two objects being the output, you can really throw anything in the middle here uh, for doing those predictions. Uh, I'll step over some of the screen. And one other thing uh, within the super learner R package I wanted to highlight is, you know, more often we're interested in getting at that prediction function, that's that super learner. But often in a real setting, we also want to evaluate, well, is it really working well? What is the, the mean squared error? Or what is my sensitivity or specificity if I'm in a binary setting? And if I want to do that, what I need to do is, again, as I mentioned earlier, I don't want to go back and do um, just a resubstitution estimate of those performance metrics. Um, what we would probably want to do is do a, another layer of default cross-validation. And so I, what this is, this is a layer of doing default cross-validation with the intent of evaluating how well the super learner algorithm is doing. Um, it's not actually running, the, it's not my final super learner, but it's evaluating how well that super learner is doing on my given data set. And so we've provided a convenient function to go and do that called cv.superlearner. And what this is, is the input looks very similar to the original super learner. Oops. Sorry, wrong button there. Um, the input looks very similar to the original super learner, but what I get now is I'll get um, estimates of default cross-validated performance metrics of both the super learner, the discrete super learner, the one that just selects a single algorithm, plus all the individual algorithms within my library, I get um, default cross-validated estimates of their performance as well from this convenient function. And so 
the cb.superlearner is a sort of helpful function if you want to go and evaluate how well the superlearner is actually doing on my given data set and relative to some of the other or just using one of the individual algorithms or relative to the cross-validation selector or the discrete superlearner um, is a helpful function for doing that. Um, but just keep in mind that the cb.superlearner is not the primary function for the superlearner. It's just a convenient function for evaluating the performance. And there's also plot methods if you want to visualize uh, those estimates as well. Um, so with that, I think I wanted to leave a few minutes for questions at the end. So I'll say thanks for your attention. And I hope this is helpful, sort of walking through both some of the, the fundamental components of SuperLearner, but also sort of some initial exposure to the R package so that you can now walk away from this um, with, you know, a tool to go and implement this on your own um, examples. With that, I'll open up if there's any questions. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, I appreciate that presentation so much. It was so clear, and I want to say thank you. And I also want to say thank you for the package. I'm a, I'm a heavy user of the Super Learner package because it's actually easier a lot of times to use a Super Learner in, interface than it is to call all these different methods on my own. So even if I don't want Super Learner, I sometimes just uh, make use of it to um, see how I'm supposed to call all these other machine learning algorithms. But on top of that, the super learner does a great job with the flexibility, and I really appreciate it. So um, we've got five more minutes. I invite everyone to enter any questions you have in the chat window. Um, but in the meantime, I will ask Eric a question. Um, can you maybe talk a little about something that comes up in my applied work where the trade-off between interpretability and transparency of a model um, and its acceptance by the professional, the, the domain experts of the maybe physicians we're collaborating with versus using SuperLearner. And um, kind of a corollary is are there, are there any, anything out there that does any kind of variable importance for SuperLearner that's already um, been written? Um, yeah, no, that's that's a great question, Susan. Um, you're right. I, the way I tend to think about interpretability and variable importance and all of those is really, you know, more abstract, and it, is, it often can be very problem dependent. I mean, what do I mean by um, interpretability? Can be both sort of overall, you know, what variables seem to be helpful in terms of prediction, but it can also be at the individual level. You know, for this given individual, what was it that sort of motivated the prediction? And both of those come up with, can come up with very different answers and in terms of interpretability and um, um, sort of explainability of those models. So I would say there are plenty of methods out there for doing that. It's not something I've tried to build directly into the SuperLearner package because I think people should be more um, you know, those other packages already exist, you can go and use those um, to be able to do that. Um, and it sort of, it comes down to what, you know, within your given application, what are you trying to do? And from my setting where I've, you know, done a lot of this work with prediction modeling in context of typically trying to help select treatments or optimal treatment allocation, I found it that it's not, you know, even the idea of, you know, of simple linear regression, doesn't necessarily have good interpretability from that context because you're just looking at assuming all other variables are held fixed. If I change one variable by one unit, what's the change in my predictive value? Um, that isn't often what we're interested in. We're often interested more about, you know, given some of these scenarios, how could, what, you know, what would modify the prediction? And so working more from almost a case series or, you know, exact, working out examples um, we often do, I've done a lot of case examples of doing like mock uh, molecular tumor boards where we have some complicated algorithm going in the background and we're sort of then introducing case series of this is how this is going, this is how a patient like this is going to be um, predicted um, given this, given the algorithm that's going on. And it really gives more context to what we mean by interpretability and application within a, within a setting. Thank you. 
that's very, very interesting and, and helpful. Um, we have a question from, from one of the participants in the audience. Yeah. It says, the main analysis of an RCT is to estimate the additive treatment effect. Suppose I want to additionally estimate or predict for a subgroup specific additive treatment effect, for example, for Asian men or Latina women. Do you see SL as a viable option to do this, where demographic variables, gender, race, et cetera, are the predictors? Further, how to compute confidence intervals for subgroup specific ATEs? Right, that's a, that's a great question. My, my answer to that, the superlinear itself is not something I would necessarily want to use just by itself for doing the subgroup specific effects. But those individual parameters could then be specified as parameter of interest within a targeted learning framework. And we could estimate the overall model using the, those variables um, using superlinear and then feed that into a targeted learning framework um, is how I would go about estimating those. So I don't think I'd want to directly read it off from the prediction, uh, but then feed back into uh, what Susan presented last week as targeted parameter interest. Right, thank you. We've also seen examples um, where targeting not only reduces bias, but it, it, it actually um, is important for asymptotic linearity of the of the S demand. So I'm going to second what Eric just just <laughs> said. Right. Um, but when we do causal inference, we, we want to combine super learning with something like TMLE. Right, and th um, that also then gives you a method for the uh, confidence interval. Oh, great. Thank mm -hmm. you. Eric, I want to thank you very much for this very clear presentation. We really appreciate you joining us today.